Today's show is brought to you by Public. You'll be hearing more about them later on. But for now, let's get into today's interview. Happy to welcome back to Forward Guidance, Michael Howell, CEO of Cross Border Capital and author of Capital Wars. Michael, wonderful to see you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Jack. Great to be here. It's great to have you here, Michael. You are an expert on the topic of global liquidity. And a year ago, when everyone you know, and their mother was bearish, you were actually quite constructive on risk assets because you argued that the global liquidity cycle had bottomed. So how about we review your views starting at the actual bottom in, in stocks in a, the fall, October of, of 2022? What indicated to you that the global uh, liquidity cycle had bottomed? And how would you summarize the pretty serious bull market in all risk assets since then? Well, I think the first thing is to look at data. I mean, we monitor something like 90 financial systems worldwide. That includes, obviously, by definition, 90 central banks, which are included in that. We're looking at what the central banks do. We're looking at what private banking groups, credit providers do as well, and we monitor cross-border flows. This was an analysis that was originally put in place when I worked at uh, the U.S. Investment Bank, Sandman Brothers. If you look at chart two that I think I, I put up in the presentation, what you'll see is our, our global liquidity index. What that shows is maybe not surprisingly a cycle. What that cycle did was it bottomed in October of 20, pretty much coincident with the British guilt crisis. That was a heads up, we thought, to policymakers worldwide to basically show what could go wrong in the treasury markets if there was insufficient liquidity. And that's pretty much what happened. From that point, what we've seen is liquidity conditions begin to strengthen. Within a couple of months of that low, maybe you know on track in a way, because banking crises normally coincide with the bottom, we got the SVB failure in the US, and then the Credit Suisse failure, et cetera. So you know, banking crises tend to occur around the bottom. Policymakers tend to panic around that stage. They begin to inch liquidity back into markets. And that's more or less what we've seen. The narrative from the Federal Reserve through this year has principally been, or sorry, through the last 12 months, I should say, has pretty much been that they're sticking to the QT quantitative tightening narrative. But actually through the back door there, they're pushing liquidity into the system, into US money markets, whether that's through the bank term funding program, whether that's been through the rundown of the, of the reverse repo facility, whether it's through Janet's, you know, Janet Yellen's moves on the Treasury general account, Everything adds up to more liquidity. And the fact is that even though the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve fell last year, liquidity, actually Fed liquidity on our definition, rose by around about 12 to 15 percent. Meaningful. That, that is very meaningful. Yeah, w- walk us through that because you know when the global liquidity and central bank liquidity entered a downturn in 2022, I think it was somewhat easier for pe- people reading the headlines and definitely for myself to associate okay, central banks are now raising interest rates and they're not doing quantitative easing and actually they're going to do quantitative tightening. So they're reducing their balance sheets, they're withdrawing cash from the system and they're, they're increasing the price of money. That is, you know, liquidity is going down. How is it that liquidity rose from October 2022 as the Federal Reserve continued to increase interest rates and continued to reduce its, its balance sheet? Tell us more about that backdoor. Yeah. If you take a look at another slide on slide 15, there are a slide there which compares the size of the Federal Reserve balance sheet with a concept that we call Fed liquidity that was described uh, in a book that I wrote a few years ago called Capital Wars, which basically, uh, I think it's, sorry, I beg your pardon, it's the, it's the next slide, 16, I beg your pardon, slide 16, which basically shows Fed balance sheet and Fed liquidity. And what this basically illustrates, the red line there is the size of the balance sheet, the hiccup, if that you like, around March of 22 was the SVB crisis when the bank term funding program basically kicked in. So that was a pure liquidity expansion that occurred. But what's more important is to look at the orange line that is shadowing that. And that orange line is basically a concept called Fed liquidity. The reason for looking at that is that the Fed balance sheet is not the only source, or let's say the, it is not the definitive source of liquidity in the money markets. What you've got to look at is basically what is put in net in terms of those flows. So for example, let me be explicit, the Treasury General account, which is an item on the balance sheet, which is the US Treasury's, if you like, deposit account or working balance account at the Federal Reserve, if that expands because tax revenues exceed outlays, the Fed is the sorry, the Treasury is building up cash at the Fed, that is a withdrawal of liquidity from markets. But the balance sheet would still expand in that under that regime. 
but it's actually a withdrawal of liquidity. Another thing would, could be the so-called reverse repo facility, which is something that the, the monetary authorities actually invented in the wake of the COVID crisis, when there were huge amounts of liquidity sloshing around the money markets, and there was a lack of treasury bills to absorb those. So the Federal Reserve, if you like, created its own security, quasi-treasury bill-like, which was a reverse repo account, and the money market funds and some of the banks put a lot of their surplus cash there. That is a withdrawal of liquidity from the system, but again, it expands the balance sheet. So what you've got to do is take into account these particular factors, which may be changing the liability mix on the Fed balance sheet, uh, but they are uh, detracting, reducing, or expanding liquidity as they change. So the question is to actually not take the balance sheet headline per se, is to drill down into the data and look at what is specifically liquidity creating. Now, what you see from the chart is that the orange line has basically bottomed out and is beginning to increase. That increase is reflected in another area of the money markets, which is bank reserves. So bank reserves are beginning to expand right now. And that's something that you would naturally expect if Fed liquidity went up. Now, what is the particular mechanism right now that's causing that, that line to increase? At the margin, the big input of being the bank term funding program, which is due as to expire in a few weeks, as it happens, at the anniversary of the B crisis. But it will likely be renewed, in our opinion, in some form. And the other thing that is going on is that the reverse repo facility at the Federal Reserve is being run down very aggressively. Now, that seems a deliberate policy. It is a corollary of what Janet has decided at the Treasury to basically switch funding away from traditionally coupons. So in other words, U.S. government notes and bonds, anything with a maturity of beyond 12 months, that constitutes a note or a bond. So funding has switched away from that area of the market into bills, treasury bills. Now, traditionally, the treasury funds itself as a rule of thumb, 80% coupon and 20% bills. Okay, The big buyers of bills traditionally tend to be credit providers. And that's an interesting point to ponder or hold a thought for later. And the coupons tend to be bought by the institutions, so the pension funds, the insurance companies, et cetera, foreign investors, particularly sovereign wealth funds, or they could be Forex managers worldwide, would buy those coupons. Now, the mix has changed. This quarter, something like 72% of U.S. Treasury funding will be through bills. So there's a whopping change in terms of what has gone on here. Now, what does that mean? Number one, it means that you've got a paring down of the, of the reverse repo facility, because in actual fact, it's probably more attractive, particularly if the funds believe that rates are falling, to switch out of the overnight facility at the Fed into a treasury bill. And so the big supply of bills is draining the reverse repo account, but simultaneously, it's injecting money into the US money markets. And that is a pure liquidity injection. Markets generally avoid by these liquidity flows. But if, if you're still with me, there's another dimension that you've got to start looking at. And that is that what are the implications of the Treasury issuing lots of bills? And particularly, if those bills are being hoovered up by credit providers like banks. Now, if, for example, a pension fund buys a Treasury security of any, of any stripe, a bill or a bond, that will not increase the size of the credit provider's balance sheets on what we would argue would be liquidity or money supply, okay? That would be effectively a source of funding that is not a monetization, okay, by definition. If the banks or the credit providers buy a treasury, a short-dated treasury or a bill, it will expand their balance sheet. And as it expands the banks or credit provider's balance sheets, that's a monetization, okay? Because of repo, because it can borrow money in the repo market? Simply like, because the bank's balance sheets expand. And as bank's balance sheets expand, you're effectively uh, providing liquidity into, into financial markets. So the distinction to draw is between, is that a purchase of a government security by a credit provider, or is it a purchase by an institution, a non-credit provider, like a pension fund? If it's a pension fund that buys the security, there's no monetary implications per se or no direct ones. If a bank buys it, what you've got is a potential increase in money supply and liquidity. That seems to be what's happening right now. So take a look at, for example, the weekly data on US bank assets 
that are published in the, I think it's the H8 release by the Federal Reserve. And what you'll see in the last few weeks is a big spike up in bank asset growth. Now, why is that going on? Probably because we don't know the mix between bill purchases and uh, treasury coupon purchases. But I would imagine that's what's happening is that they're starting to buy a lot more bills. It's attractive for a bank to buy a bill because they can get a high interest rate relative to their deposit, what they're paying on the deposits. So they're doing that. Now, this is pure and simple expansion of money or expansion of liquidity. Recall what Stanley Druckermiller said a few weeks ago in a celebrated and well-watched speech where he said, if you look at the numbers that are coming out of the Treasury right now, the huge amount of bill issuance that you're getting is reminiscent of Argentina, not the United States of America. And this is basically the danger that you've got. And this is why you know we're concerned in the medium term by monetization and the threat of monetization in Western financial systems. As I've said many times before, we're not calling the US, the US out here necessarily. The US may be the cleanest shirt in the laundry. But the fact is that this is happening generally across the West. And it's an important point to note. But liquidity is expanding. Today's show is brought to you by Public. Public.com has just launched its new high-yield cash account, offering an industry leaving 5.1% APY. No fees, no subscription, no minimums or maximums, just 5.1% interest on your cash. You can transfer or withdraw cash as often as you like, and you get up to $5 million FDIC insurance. Grow your cash at an industry-leading 5.1% APY with a high-yield cash account at Public. Go to public.com slash forward guidance to learn more. That's public.com slash forward guidance. This is a paid endorsement for public.com. 5.1% APY as of December 20, 2023 and is subject to change. Full disclosures and terms and conditions can be found in the podcast description. High yield cash accounts are available for US members only. Thanks. Let's get back to the interview. So I, I think I actually do get, get your point now about the banks is that if a, a pension fund or a institution buys a treasury bill that's not a bank, they do it with deposits that already exist that they have, right. whereas banks issue deposits, so they, they expand the money supply. That, that makes sense. And, and so overall, your, your point is liquidity is rising. Uh, we'll get more into the plumbing in a sec, but now I guess let's just quickly give us a, a sense of the implications. Well, well, I'll put up two charts. One is the correlation between monetary inflation, you know, liquidity, and crypto and gold, as well as the four different zones of you know, speculation, turbulence, and rebound. I think you're in rebound now and how that has an implication for all assets, but particularly U.S. equities as well as uh, sectors. So we'll put up the chart of crypto and gold now. Yeah. Well, this is an interesting chart in the sense that what the black line is looking at is our estimates of global liquidity. And that is basically an aggregate which currently sits at around 170 trillion U.S. dollars. A lot of the numbers I, I would stress that people quote for global liquidity is a misquote. Uh, these numbers are about 30 trillion. What they're looking at, as far as we can tell, is looking at just the bank balance sheet, uh, World Bank, World Central Bank balance sheets. So that's a small you know, drop in the bucket in terms of what is the global liquidity picture. You've got to look at all credit providers. You've got to look at uh, money markets. You've got to look at collateral-based repo funding, et cetera. And if you add all that up, what you get is the black line which is a number of about $170 trillion, so considerably more than central bank balance sheets. Our view is that what you've, what you've got is, a, is an expansion in liquidity represents a monetary inflation. Now, I draw that distinction very clearly between what we think of as a monetary inflation and a cost inflation. The two things are very, very different and distinct. However, they both come together in a hybrid, which is high, high street inflation. So think of High street inflation is a cocktail mix between monetary inflation and cost inflation. Now, costs are the obvious things like higher oil prices, weaker productivity, increasing taxes, etc. Cost inflation got a significant step up following the COVID emergency when the supply side of economies broke down uh, because of the COVID disruption. And that clearly was a cost inflationary jump, street prices up. But alongside that, you've had a monetary inflation. And that monetary inflation is actually not just a short-term phenomenon. It's actually been a long-term phenomenon, uh, as we show in that chart. Now, the key point to take away here is that monetary hedges like gold are not necessarily hedges against high street inflation, but they are hedges against monetary inflation. And that's the key point. That's why you can see the paradox. There are times 
when gold can go up even though high street inflation is going down because the fall in high street inflation is being driven by lower costs, okay? And that's pretty much what you saw through last year. Inflation was falling, but the gold price was generally edging up. Now, what we've got coming into the equation is a new monetary hedge, which is basically cryptocurrencies, specifically, let's say, Bitcoin. And for younger generations who don't probably know the value of gold, or don't understand gold, or find gold maybe too archaic, Bitcoin is their monetary hedge. And I think this is the thing to start thinking about. Now, there's an interesting historic parallel here. I don't want to go over the top here, but I just want to wave the scent of what could go on. And if you go back to Weimar, Germany, in the wake of World War I in the early 1920s, and think about what happened in, in Weimar, Germany, we know there was a hyperinflation. And the hyperinflation came from the German government basically printing money to pay bills basically in the wake of World War I because it couldn't afford its reparation payments and it just printed money. And so you saw a hyperinflation. Now, we all know that part, but the next point is an interesting one. How did the different generations within Germany react to that hyperinflation? The older generations were bondholders and they, if you like, sat pat and this saw their wealth diminish or be de devalued by, by the hyperinflation. The younger generations tried to hedge as best they could, and many of them hedged through the stock market. So what you saw was not only a very strong stock market in Weimar Germany, in other words, not in normal terms, but you saw a massive shift in the distribution of income and wealth from the older generations to the younger generations. Now, that didn't end well because the younger generations felt that the older generation had, had sold them out in World War I, and they started to move towards the nationalist parties, as we know, the Nazis or whatever, and that ended really badly. But you get my point here, that what they were doing was they were seeking out monetary hedges. Now, I'm not in any way suggesting there is a, a, a close parallel with what's going on now, but I'm saying that, look, there is a, we're, we're maybe taking one small step down that road. And is it that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are the equivalent monetary hedge for younger generations now in the way that equity markets were a monetary hedge for many of the earlier generations, you know, basically in the wake of World War I or World War II, et cetera. And that's a thought, and all I say is hold that thought. And maybe what we're looking at is a world now where the traditional safe assets are no longer government 10-year bonds, as they always were, and the ideal risk asset to hedge a monetary inflation is no longer equities, it's something else like a cryptocurrency. I'm saying that's right, but it's a it's a, a point to ponder. Yes, and thankfully, I think with with Germany, they owed tons of debt in a, in a currency that they did not control. Whereas U.S., you know, we owe debt in in dollars, which you know we we still we still can print. There are differences. But yeah. All I'm saying is, let's look at the response. Is how do the younger generation respond to mm. a monetary inflation? Will they go into stocks? They don't want to go into bonds. That's for sure. They may go into crypto, they may go into tech stocks, something that they understand or gravitate to, towards more sensibly. Michael, I, I just want to say all of this that we're talking about, you, you're going to be covering it at the BlockWorks Digital Asset Summit in March of this year, March 18th and 20th. I'm going to be interviewing you alongside Julian Brigden and Joseph Wang. So it's going to be a, a real treat. And uh, folks should click the link in the description to, to get tickets if they can, because uh, people, you know, if they, if they like this conversation, the one that we're going to have on stage is going to be uh, even better. I think I'm much looking forward to that. I, I know Joseph, I don't know, I don't know Julian, but Joseph, I do know, and, you know, he's full of insight about how the Federal Reserve works from the inside. So I'm going to much look forward to that, to that discussion. And I think there's, it's, you know, it's an exciting time for digital assets. I mean, that's for sure, particularly given the, the news out very recently about the Bitcoin ETF. You know, the, the, the doors are open. These are fantastic monetary hedges, in my view, in the medium term. Yeah, so you, you really uh, got to be there. So click the link in the description to uh, get tickets and you can use the code FG10 to get 10% off. Michael, what about uh, the stock market? Presumably rising liquidity is, is bullish for, for equities uh, as it was last year. Uh, let's put up this chart of just showing the four different phases of the markets. There's, uh, excuse me, um, there's uh, uh, a rebound, calm, speculation, and turbulence. So did we just come out of turbulence in 2022? And are we 
or was, was last year the rebound? Correct. So what this is basically saying is from our screening of almost 100 economies worldwide, looking at their reference liquidity cycles, which markets are in rebound, calm, speculation, or the turbulence phase of the investment cycle. And that's what the diagram shows. So the red is turbulence. The orange is a speculation phase. Those two phases are not great for equity investment or basically risk assets. Speculation, you can make money, but it's clearly highly volatile. If you look at the other two, the rebound and the calm areas, that's when traditional risk assets like equities tend to perform well. And what you can see is that we've now got a situation where something like 65% of the world is now moving into this zone. So if you then move to your traffic light diagram, we argue we're now predominantly in the rebound area, but clearly we're moving towards calm. Now, let me, let me stress with this diagram that it is, it is based on historic data. That data you know, changes inches or moves glacial-like. So in other words, the position of those traffic lights is not going to change. In other words, what I'm trying to say here is that we move through rebound, calm, speculation, turbulence cyclically, but what works in rebound or what works in calm tends to be pretty much set in stone. There are nuances, but generally the, these, uh, these traffic lights are approximately right. Now, one of the things that convinced us that things are on track was if you take a look at the uh, distribution of those traffic lights in rebound through, on the left, assets, and on the right, industry groups of the stock market. What you would have expected to see in a rebound phase was your risk on risk off uh, metric, the first traffic light, would have been roughly neutral. So, you know, maybe you're inching from, you're moving from turbulence where we were, red traffic light uh, towards uh, amber. So you, you're, you're starting to get going. You've got your, you know, you've got your foot on the gas pedal, maybe gently. If you look at the next row down equities, equities, green traffic light, they should be good during a rebound phase. Credit markets should be good during a rebound phase. Equities and credits were big performers last year, generally in the US markets for sure. A lot of people were dishing credits, but actually credits came out of the year pretty well. And, you know, hence the green traffic light. If you look at commodities and the lower row is bond duration, in other words, do you want to buy uh, long dated uh, government debt? There are red lights. Okay. Now, maybe bond duration wasn't that bad in the event, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a stunning performer and it was highly volatile through the year. If you look at industry groups, there's another heads up here. Cyclical should outperform during rebound. Technology is a star. Financials, not so good. Energy, not good. Defensive stocks, red light. Okay. Move towards calm. What are you seeing? Cyclicals again. Technology still good. Financials start to perform well. And energy starts to come back. Defensive still red light. So we think that if you look forwards, and the art of investment is pretty much saying, look, what is the economy going to look like? Not tomorrow, but in about in 12 months time. So let's say by the end of the year, what are, what's the economic business climate like you look like? And then you can kind of assess what your correct investment strategy should be today. So our view is that the economy will be worth bottomed out. It'll be expanding again. The liquidity cycle will be stronger and therefore we'll be nearer what we argue is the calm phase. We think we'll probably get there by the middle of this year. And that would suggest that you want to start looking for signs of outperformance from financials. And you want to be looking at things like the yield curves beginning to steepen now. These are all heads up to where we are. Now, the bottom line in our analysis is pretty much to say, look, there's a lot of normal things going on, and there's a number of abnormal things going on. The liquidity cycle looks to us pretty normal, okay? Maybe it's a tad lower than you'd expected in past cycles, but it's in pretty, pretty much on track, as you would suspect. Central banks are coming back. The timing looks to be good. All we'd argue is perhaps we want more liquidity, but we think we're getting it anyway. Equity markets have performed pretty much as you'd expected, okay? Credit markets have performed pretty much as you'd expected. So what's abnormal going on here? But the, the, the sort of tenor, the drumbeat from investors and pundits is, it's all very different this time. It's not. What is different, though, are the bond markets. And what is specifically different is the treasury market. And the treasury market is different because 
the monetary authorities are manipulating or interfering with the market. They're distorting the normal pricing mechanism. And we call that not QE, QE, and not yield curve control, yield curve control. There's a lot of manipulation which is going on. Now, I showed you the chart earlier, slide 16, which was looking at what the Federal Reserve was doing. But another heads up is to think of what the Treasury is doing because of the skew of funding towards bills and away from coupons. And that's clearly having an effect as well. Now, if you take a look at the next slide, which is, I think, slide 17 on the pack, what that's showing is the US Treasury 10-year bond, which is shown there in orange. That's the yield on the bond. And the black line, this is monthly data, by the way, and the black line is an adjusted 10-year. Now, you had a guest on Forward Guidance a few weeks ago, George Robertson, who pretty much nailed this thing exactly. And my ears pricked up because this was exactly the same analysis that we were thinking of. But on the other hand, we're both alumni of Salomon Brothers, and so maybe we think of these things in similar terms. George had a very simple solution to the problem. We had a more complex one. I actually kind of like his one. And what he said is there's just a yield spread difference between mortgages and treasuries. We went a little bit more complicated, maybe unnecessarily, and did a lot of convexity and duration adjustments to the mortgage curve and tried to synthesize a risk-free 10-year 10, 10 bond from the mortgage curve. Now, mortgages, because they've got the backing of the GSEs, government-sponsored enterprises like Fannie and Freddie, they're more or less like a government security. And therefore, they're like a risk-free bond. So if you make the appropriate duration adjustment from a 30-year treasury to a 10-year government, then you've got some sense as to an equivalent risk-free instrument, if you're with me. And what this chart is showing is the tracking of an adjusted equivalent mortgage bond to the 10-year treasury. And just look at the gap that you're getting between the yield, the two yields. Now, the interesting point is that, or two interesting points come out of this. Number one is that in a pure world, US government treasury yields should be higher than they are now because they should be reflecting what the mortgage market's doing because that's the true risk-free in our view now because the treasury through its bill issuance and the Fed through its, its uh, liquidity expansion are distorting the markets, right? So they have actually compressed yields. They push yields down by about 120 basis points below what they should be. Now, that has two implications. One is that maybe there is an upward trend or pressure on US Treasury yields to rise again and close that gap. So hold that thought. In other words, yields could be going up, not down. Second thought is that if yields are compressed by 120 basis points, doesn't that mean that the yield curve is going to be unnecessarily inverted? And doesn't that also mean that economists who are using the yield curve to predict recession or not are basically over-egging it because they're seeing too much of an inversion there? And that's really the point that we'd make. Now, the interesting heads up is if you plot that spread between the mortgage market and the treasury market, you get the slide that we put on the next page, which is then looking at bill issuance versus that spread. And this is what I've, what I've shown here is yields, yield suppression. So the black line is the differential between the US sized mortgage yield and the 10-year bond. So in other words, that's on the right-hand scale. And 120 means 120 points basis points spread of difference. The orange line is the rate of growth of treasury bill issuance. It's not a bad correlation. So every time the funding mechanism switches towards bills on the way from coupons, essentially what's happening is there's a scarcity of coupons. Their prices are bid up, their yields are bid down relative to mortgages. And what you see is that spread opening up. And that is telling you there's a lot of manipulation going on. And in other words, we're looking at the beginnings of this monetary inflation. This is fascinating. Yeah, my interview with George Robertson came out in November. I think we filmed it on you know, November 1st, which was, I think, the, the day of, or if it wasn't November 1st, early November, you know, the day of around the time that, that their miraculous bull market in, in stocks at that time. So I, I, George's call has aired 
very well. He is extremely on the fiscal dominant front that the, the Federal Reserve's policy, uh, you know, is is much less important than what the fiscal authorities are doing, you know, and treasury bill issues, that's that's the the treasury, not the Fed. So yeah, I would I would put you know you, George Robertson and Joseph Wang kind of in the the pantheon of forward guidance in terms of market calls and views having having uh, aged well. So this, with the caveat, Michael, that this is above my my uh, head and my pay grade, uh, I, w- I would ask two questions. One, how much of this uh, this phenomena is the spread of agency mortgage backed securities over treasuries, which I know correlate a lot with whether the Fed is doing quantitative easing or quantitative tightening. So you know the, the, the spread's very narrow from 2009 to 2014. It was you know, wider from 2016 to, to 2018. It was very, very narrow in you know, 2020, in the, in the summer of 2020 and 2021. And then it's, it widened in 2022 when the Fed started reducing its balance sheet. And I, I should say this is agency mortgage-backed securities, so not credit risk vehicles such as the things that you know blew up the financial system in the in, in 2008 great financial crisis. Um, and, and my second question is: when, when you say that the Fed, the Treasury are, are manipulating the market, is it is it possible to say another way to say that is that they're actually they they were manipulating the market before? In other words, when they were doing quantitative easing, the spread was artificially low, and now the spread is returning to sort of more normal levels. Well, I, I would say that if you look at the the degree of differential between mortgages or the calculated risk free from the mortgage market and the and the treasury, there's an awful lot of activity going on right now. I mean, the skew, as I said, the skew in bill issuance is, is phenomenal. But, it, but you're absolutely right to say that what the Federal Reserve does has also got to be included, and the Federal Reserve has clearly had an effect over time. Now, one of the things I think to look at is, I think this is sort of getting into the, into the weeds of the bond market, but the bond market is very important to look at for all investors, because it really is the heartbeat of the system in many ways. What the, fix, what the fixed income markets show globally, and I've got a slide, I think, I believe it's slide 19, which shows this, is looking at what's happening to term premium worldwide. Now, just to try and show the, the picture, this is term premium. Now, term premium are a wonkish concept. I've spoken about them before. They're really at the heart of what's going on the yield curve. They are the extra amount that bond investors demand to, to be paid to own a long-duration bond. So in other words, their compensation for interest rate risk, and they're normally positive. What you've got worldwide on our estimation, looking at a term premium across the world, is that you've got predominantly negative term premium. And that's saying that there's essentially a, a shortage of, of safe assets or government bonds in the system. And you can see that right across the world, whether it's German bonds, whether it's Japanese JGBs, you know, whether it's US treasuries. Now, in the case of Japan, that's clearly being manufactured by the Bank of Japan, hoovering up most of the out, outstanding JGBs. You know, some people are even suggesting recently on, on, on social media that the, that the US is going to do the same thing. I'm not so sure about that, but I mean, clearly the direction is important. But the point that we're making is that all these term premia are negative. But if you look at the chart closer, you'll see there is a tendency recently for them start to start to go up. And... That increase in term premium is something which is driven by the amount of liquidity in the system relative to the supply of coupon bonds. Now, if the Federal Reserve starts to increase liquidity, or the Bank of Japan starts to increase liquidity, or the the ECB increases liquidity, term premium around the world will start to go up. Okay. Equally, if you get a situation where there's a big supply of coupon debt, you'll get term premium going up. Now, whichever option you have, whether it's more Fed or central bank liquidity or whether it's more issuance, the fact is the term premium on my uh, analysis here are too low and they have to rise. And if you look at the, the next chart along, which is uh, looking at slide 20, what that shows is term premium in the US, the black line. And the supply, the net supply of collateral in the system. So, in other words, this is looking at the supply of coupon bonds. It takes into account the mix of treasuries and bills in the system. It takes into account what the Federal Reserve buys in terms of their allocation of bonds. It takes into account a notional uh, take up of bonds by foreigners. But the orange line has been projected forwards to try and show that the growth 
in net, net collateral supply is going from negative to positive. As we saw negative collateral supply growth, or, or very low, I should say, collateral supply growth in the last few years, what we then saw was negative term premium, and that's compressed term premium worldwide. On top, you've got to throw in the effect of Japan, what Japan was doing with Bank of Japan, you know, buying up all these bonds. These things have distorted the market via term premium. And what this analysis is telling us is that term premium have got to rise, and therefore bond yields have got to rise. And that would suggest that you don't really want to be in the bond markets as an investor. By all means, go at the front end, because the front end, you're safe in terms of interest rate risk, at least you know, in the short term. But looking longer term, there's got to be an issue particularly if inflation starts to pick up high street inflation here. Now, we think we're in an environment of monetary inflation. That's what I keep saying. This is an environment which is different to what we've seen in the past. Monetary inflation is coming to a high street near you. It will mean higher inflation rates in the medium term, not necessarily this year. I mean, I'm clear that the rebound of the supply sides of economies may well push high street inflation down further this year. But looking into the medium term, I would say that you're looking at higher inflation rates. And Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve ceiling at 2% inflation is much more likely to be a floor going forward than a ceiling. And that means that bond markets are not likely to be a medium term performer, in my estimation. And you want monetary hedges, and those monetary hedges are likely equities, and they're likely things like gold and cryptocurrencies. And so, yeah, term premia, the, the basic definition is how much extra compensation investors demand for taking the risk of owning longer term bonds. And needless to say, the, cl- the shorter term a, a fixed income treasury security is, uh, you know, bond, note, bill, the, the more cash like it is. So a 30 year bond right. takes a lot of balance sheet to, to hold, you know, buy and own because it can move a lot because it has a very long duration. Whereas a three month treasury bill, it's pretty much the same thing as a, a cash cash yeah. or bank reserve. So Michael, just to, to wrap a bow on this, if it sounds like there are three forces that cause liquidity, central bank market liquidity to rise significantly in the US in 2023 and talking about the Fed and the treasury. Number one is the treasury issuing a lot more bills than coupons. So that the thing we just talked about. Number two is the Fed's bank term funding program, you know, started in March in response to the, the mini banking crisis uh, uh, then. And number three is the draining of the reverse repo facility, which was predictable. You talked about it. I also, you know, Joseph Lang talked about it very early on. And, and maybe there's some other forces, but how would you rank those three forces from the most impactful to the, the least? Well, I think in terms of science, the bank term funding program is the, moment, the, small, the smaller of those. The, the, for the last 12 months, the draining of the reverse repo has been the big issue for sure, because what you've seen there is that the reverse repo was up at about over two, 2.5 trillion US dollars. It's now down to 600 billion. You know, there's another 600 billion maybe to be drained from it. That's sizable amounts of money uh, in any terms, but we've already seen 2 trillion come out of the reverse repo and go into the markets. So that's been the big effect last year. The Treasury bill issuance point is, 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 is really outside of the Fed balance sheet and or is also outside of the Fed balance sheet. But that's what the banks are doing or the credit providers do. And that's what I would suggest is maybe something to think about in the future because one of the drivers of liquidity through this year is likely to be the private sector credit providers. And maybe this is a mechanism by which this is happening as you start to see bill issuance increasing and the credit providers buying that. Now, that's a way that they can actually expand their profits. One of the things I think I would look at very closely as a heads up to generally liquidity increasing is whether bank stocks are actually outperforming the S&P. And I would think, you know, this is something we've got to look at very closely. For the year as a whole last year, they didn't. But, you know, we're beginning to get some sniff of outperformance towards year end. And that we think should continue. So, you know, the big US banks, I mean, JP, JPM or whatever, should be, you know, decent performers looking forward. But in terms, of, in terms of the ranking, therefore, I would say, you know, number one would probably be the switch to bills and what credit providers are doing with their balance sheet. Number two would still be the fact that you've got money to be drained from the RRP, 600 billion. And then you've got the term funding program, which will likely be renewed. But that's, you know, maybe that's very specific and very targeted funding 
but it's only, if I recall, about 120 billion. All right. So in uh, the most powerful forces, first bill issuance, then reverse repo draining, then bank term funding program. Let me just add that just to be crystal clear. The question to pose, if this is sounding you know, very wonkish and very arcane, is to say, look, what is the difference between the U.S. government funding itself through a bank loan from the banks and a treasury bill that the banks buy? What's the difference? There isn't any. It's the same thing. Michael, now let's put up a chart just of the Fed liquidity and the different drivers last year. So in the dark orange, we've got Fed liquidity and then lighter orange, change in reverse repo, lighter, even lighter orange, slower quantitative t- tightening, and the lightest color is more defense spending. So tell us about... Let me walk you through that. Please. That, that uh, charm which maybe needs some explaining. And let me just you know reiterate once again that we're not hitting out on the U.S. here. The U.S. may well be, the U.S. has got a problem, but the U.S. is likely the cleanest shirt in the laundry. If you start looking at other countries, particularly in Europe or even Japan, this is a much, much, much worse situation. So, you know, this is why we think the dollar holds up in this environment. The U.S. being a reserve currency is still in a luxurious position vis-a-vis the rest of the world. What this chart is showing is the dark orange or brown area, which is called Fed liquidity, is the estimates of Fed liquidity that one derives from the Congressional Budget Office latest report on funding of the US government. Okay, so you can actually see the amount that the, the is implied in that data for what the Federal Reserve actually supplies in terms of funding. That's the brown area. Look at the dog leg on the chart. So it's even even they are suggesting that you've got you know a turnaround in terms of ending of QT and beginning of QT, QE, if that's where you think about it. The slightly darker orange, which is labeled their changes in RRP, is the effect of the change in the rundown of the RRP account, which is a further source of liquidity. Then you've got two other things, slower QE, which is basically then saying, we assume that it's going to be very difficult for the US authorities to continue a, an aggressive QT at the same time as they're cutting interest rates. That may not square. And in fact, already Laurie Logan and used to run the SOMA account for the FOMC, and now President of the Dallas Fed has alluded in a speech in recent days to the fact they may well be curtailing the QT program in some form. And then you've got on top, defense spending. Defense spending is clearly an issue, a political issue. If you look at the Congressional Budget Office estimates, they've got relatively tame defense spending. I think what we've seen in the last 12 months is that there's a very clear heads up to say that the West generally needs to spend more on defense spending. The armaments industry is it has basically found it difficult to supply traditional armaments to Ukraine. And what we put in here is estimates of 5% of GDP, which looks to be you know, probably a reasonable figure. So what that would suggest is this is what happens to the Fed balance sheet, or in other words, Fed liquidity, or the liquidity creating component. The percentages there are the percentage changes that we envision from those increases. So, you know, maybe we've been, you know, a a tad tad aggressive in these figures, but nonetheless, I mean, it's a debating point. And it looks as if this is an avenue of more liquidity creation in the future. And as I keep saying, you know, hammer home, this is not just a US problem, this is a global problem. And the US is in a much better shape than anywhere else. And I'm sure you you saw the note in the, I believe it was the the minutes about Quanti- taper and quantitative tightening. Uh, when do you think the, the Federal Reserve starts to taper quantitative tightening? And when do you think it stops quantitative tightening or even goes back to quantitative easing? Because a lot of, a lot of the forces that we talked about, particularly the draining of the reverse repo facility, you know, there's only, as you said, 600 or so billion left. Obviously, that's a lot, a lot of money. But you know, it's not like it can go negative. So the money has to come from, from somewhere. What's, what's your t- view on, on when the Fed's balance sheet stops contracting? and might even start to expand via quantitative easing. Okay, well, I mean, I, I'll give you the, the, the view or the, the uh, projection that we've always made, which is March of this year. So we've always said that March would be the likely time there would be some inflection in terms of, of the QT process. And I, I don't see any reason to change that particularly. I think the problem that the US authorities have got, maybe that Laurie Logan alluded to, is that once you start to see the reverse repo drained fully and you see the bank term funding program in theory being terminated or coming to an end, then you've got the problem that money market liquidity is going to start to go down. In other words, bank reserves will also start to fall off. Now, if that's the case, you may run into problems with regional banks again. 
Now, we know that the Feds are probably likely looking very closely at regional bank balance sheets, but regional banks are not Bank of America nor, nor JPN. There's a huge number of smaller banks that will find it difficult to get reserves or hold reserves. And therefore, we've got to be very cognizant of the risks, the tail risks there. And therefore, I would say that they will not want to get let bank reserves in aggregate fall. They will, they will like to see liquidity in money markets maintained. And I think there have to be other means of actually getting funds there. And the difficulty they have is that traditionally at this time of year, the Treasury General account, which is the Treasury's account at the Federal Reserve, in other words, its working balances, I, as I said, tends to be seasonally high because tax inflows tend to be uh, above outlays, traditional outlays. So the Treasury General account tends to rise during the first months of the year. And therefore, that's taking liquidity further out of the money markets. So it's a difficult period to negotiate. You know, as they, as they say in, in Ireland, if you want to travel to Dublin, let's not start from here. And that's the challenge. Right. And I now want to ask you about the connection between the liquidity cycle and the economic cycle and how they're not always the, the same. And often the liquidity cycle leads the economic cycle. For example, the liquidity cycle had a downturn in 2022, but real bank lending and credit creation to the real economy in 2022 was at an all-time high. It's just that in the financial economy, right. it, it, was, it, was, it was quite low. So I've heard you make that distinction before that we're talking about global liquidity it's within the financial system not necessarily within the real economy and the real economy and the financial system can can compete for liquidity so how does your outlook on liquidity coincide what does that pretend for the economic cycle you know the much anticipated recession did not occur in 2023 and you know so that people who are expected a soft landing they their their calls have aged well. I mean, it, it remains to be seen what is going to happen this year. But what do you think is going to happen this year? And as a reference for our audience, we can you know, put up the 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 chart of the different how the different cycles play with each other about right right here. Well, let, let me say this. I mean, the the traditional economic cycle, which is based on capital expenditure, it, it is a textbook model that probably has let's say a duration of about ten years, typically. It's based on the, on the replacement cycle of capital goods, and it tends to be very interest rate sensitive. Now, you know, that, that was a fairly decent way of understanding the economy for decades, but it was in decades past. Who's doing massive amounts of capital spending now in a world where, <clears throat> a Western world at least, where service industry is really the dominant part of economies and where debt is a major uh, factor overhanging uh, financial markets. As we've said many times before, financial markets are no longer new financing vehicles for CapEx. They're, they're effectively refinancing vehicles for debt. And that's the way to think about them. Now, in other words, the cycle of liquidity is being driven by the debt recycling, sorry, refinancing cycle. And that tends to be about five to six years. So if the old capital spending cycle was 10 years in the past, and it was an interest rate driven cycle, we're now looking at a liquidity cycle, which is basically five to six years. So you've got a debt recycling, debt refinancing cycle, which is really driving everything. Now, that liquidity inflates or deflates at different times asset markets because it's fungible. It spills over. If there's lots of liquidity that is put in for refinancing, it will spill over into other assets, equities or cryptocurrencies or whatever, and it will inflate asset prices. Asset prices are a wealth effect, and they help to drive economies. So number one is you've still got a wealth effect coming through and, you know, U.S. real estate prices are still pretty high. You know, looking at the case, Schiller, they're still, they think they're still rising, in fact. And if you look at the equity market, the S&P had a decent year. So these are positive wealth effects. It will boost consumer spending. U.S. consumers, from my estimates, have still got about $18 trillion of liquid assets. This is a vast amount of, of cash flow that will have to go somewhere. And then you've got... Another, you know, you've got other factors which basically come into this, which is fiscal policy is remarkably loose. So what you've got is a backdrop where positive wealth effects and the impact of very, very general fiscal spending is underpinning the U.S. economy. And it's really as simple as that. So why should the economy have a major recession? I don't think I mean, I've never been in that camp. It may well have a slowdown because rates are going up. But the real danger, I think I've said before on the program, Jack, is that it's not about the cycle. It's about the trend. 
If you keep interest rates at these levels for so long, you're going to impair lending by the small to medium sized banking banking banks in the US. And they are what really drive American productivity in the, in the medium term. So the longer you keep interest rates high, the more you impair the trend in growth. It's not about the cycle that's important here. It's the longer term trend. I still think the economy comes out of this pretty well. And so I would expect if you look for inflections, I think you'll see an inflection in the economy certainly by the, by the middle of the year. So it sounds like you you might be somewhere in between the soft landing camp and the no landing camp because you, you don't think there will be a recession, maybe a slowdown, but you also think maybe inflation will go back up, not to the 9%, but maybe, you know, three mildly above the Fed's target of 2%. 2025, 2026 future. And I still think if you look at the, the short term with oil prices down, with US productivity data looking pretty good, you know, with lots of other factors, the impairment of the supply side coming back, or, be, or, or the supply to be repaired, rather, what you're going to get is probably inflation pressures coming down further through this year. Mm. And so uh, a lot of the work you do is on balance sheet capacity, the ability of the financial system to provide liquidity to, to other uh, institutions in the financial system. Uh, but then there's also the demand for that liquidity, again, for the real economy, as well as the financial economy. Is it fair to say that the demand for liquidity in 20 was actually somewhat low relative to expected. In other words, uh, folks in 2022 were, were saying as interest rates at these levels are unsustainable because there's so much debt and it can't be refinanced at, at 2%. People were saying the economy can't handle 2%, let alone 5.5%. You know, with the benefit of hindsight, we now know that a lot of the debt on the in the U.S., on the corporate side, so for, for companies as well as for households, was very long duration debt. You know, Amazon issuing a 40 year bond with a, a, yeah. you know, a few basis, 10 basis points over treasuries in 2021. They're not going to have to refinance that. And if anything, they make money with their, on, their, on their short term cash. Likewise, so many folks you know, uh, took out a mortgage at very low rates in 2020 or refied those rates, and they're not going to uh, move out of their home to, uh, unless they have to. So the, the duration of, of their uh, mortgages is, is very long. So um, can, can you comment on, on that phenomena that in the US, at least, the long fixed rate, na- the, the long duration fixed rate nature of much of the household and corporate debt, you know, prolonged this economic cycle and, and staved off many of the slowdown effects from the right hiking cycle. The one institution, as we said, that had short term floating rate debt or you know, short term debt is the US government, but they can print money. So, so they're fine. Yeah, I mean, you were exactly right. I mean, the, the, the maturity wall is out there probably two or three years out. You know, markets don't have to face that in the short term. So I think that's, that's clearly a positive. And, you know, very sensibly, a lot of U.S. corporations and households did refinancing when rates were lower. They extended duration. And that's a perfectly sensible thing to do. And it's being well rewarded now in an environment where rates are, are higher. So absolutely, that's, that's got to be a, a big factor. But you know, I think the other thing one's got, to, one's got to say is that we're living in a global world and we've got to start thinking about what other central banks are doing. Now, one of the things that struck me in terms of recent commentary was from the Port of LA, which recently came out with their year-end statement that said, you know, shipping volumes are going up. They've been rising. World trade has been rising for the last few months. We've seen shipping freight rates going up, although that may be for geopolitical reasons as well. But what you're starting to see is maybe some inkling of a turn going on uh, on the West Coast ports. Now, if you start to take a look at a slide, which is further in the presentation on slide uh, 27, which is looking at China, and we haven't mentioned China yet, and China may well be in a difficult situation. But let me just explain. What you saw in the West, in terms of the West's response to the COVID crisis was basically an increase in spending, in other words, a boost to demand. Now, if you look at a very simple supply demand diagram analysis, if you get a supply shock downwards and you boost demand, what happens? Prices go up, so you get inflation. That's textbook economics, microeconomics, and that's exactly what happened in the West. What happened in China was very different. China got a COVID shock, supply side Supply curve dropped back, dropped, went to the move to the left. What did they do? They reduced spending and demand. So what you saw there was not a price response, was an output response. So that's why the Chinese economy 
has been flat in its back in the doldrums. Because what they did is they squeezed output. They didn't have the inflation response. In actual fact, they've had deflation. Now, what you're getting as supply renormalizes is that the West should see falling inflation and China should be seeing rising output. Now, the point is that Jay, Jay Powell has been far more successful in getting the inflation down in the US than Xi Jinping has been in China in getting output restarted. That may tell us something about the structural problems that China has. And so what they're starting to do is to try and goose the economy more and more. And if you see this, this chart, what it's showing is the stimulus that is being provided by the People's Bank to the Chinese economy. And this is looking, as the chart says, the People's Bank of China, it's a 28-day rolling liquidity injections, and the MTLF is medium-term loan facility. So basically, this is the inflows into Chinese money markets on a daily basis or a rolling month. And what you can see here, a huge amount of some liquidity that the Chinese have thrown at their markets. The answer is 5 trillion uh, RMB in the last six months. So these are big amounts of cash to throw in. They're trying to get the economy moving. Now, the interesting point is that maybe it is moving. And what we've done here is to show this chart, which is looking at PBOC liquidity injections over the last decade or so, 15 years, which is the, or, the orange line. And the black line is an index of shipping activity in the Asia Pacific region. Now, what that is basically illustrating, the black line, is the volume growth of US Pacific ports, so Long Beach and LA. It includes container shipments out of China and it includes throughput through Singapore ports. And those four areas contribute data to that index. So it's not one series, it's a series of data, data graphs. And what you can see is the correlation with a completely independent gauge, which is Chinese PBOC liquidity injections, is pretty impressive. You know, China leads by about three months in terms of that, that chart. And what it's saying is, why have you seen this pickup in Asia Pacific trade? It's because China has got its foot flat on the boards here in terms of liquidity expansion. And that clearly is something one's got, to, one's got to recognize. And therefore, we're living in a world economy, and therefore China is starting to get its economy going through the export markets. And that may be a further element in causing disinflation to spread through the Western economies on a 12-month view. Very interesting. And uh, you know, you, you've got to walk me through the, the ins and outs of the Chinese financial system, not nearly as familiar with it as I am the, the American financial system and, and the Federal Reserve. But if we have a spectrum of types of stimulus or, or attempts at stimulus, on the one end, it's central banks printing money, and it actually goes to the real economy, such as occurred in 2020, where the, the, the central banks bought a lot of the bonds that the US government was was issuing. And that was used to send, you know, some of it was used to send people checks in the mail, very stimulative, to make loans to businesses that were forgiven, very stimulative. So that's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is the central banks printing money or making what, what they think of is as liquidity or central bank liquidity available to banks, but very little of it gets into the real economy or it gets into the financial economy, let alone the real economy. And I think an example of that is, for example, you know, quantitative easing in 2009, the Federal Reserve printed a lot of money, but the, the recovery was, was quite limited and very, very slow. And I guess the extreme example of that would be what the Federal Reserve did during the Great Depression, where they, they, they thought that the issue with, with banks was that they were running out of paper currency. So they, they you know, went around to all the banks and said, hey, here's a paper currency, we're, we're supplying liquidity. Of course, that's not what was actually the need. So on that spectrum, I would say, the, what China did in 2009, I believe, was very stimulative. And you know, China was probably you know, one of the most aggressive stimulators uh, of its own domestic and global economy coming out of the great financial crisis, more so than, than Europe and even the US. What, where would you say this type of stimulus from the People's Bank of China is on that spectrum? Because you know, uh, is, is it actually going to you know, drive credit growth and kind of bail out the Chinese domestic economy, maybe, you know, re restore some some order to the to the real estate market, which has taken a big hit, maybe, you know, get uh, Chinese consumers to could consume more and have a virtuous cycle? Or is it of that variety where it's just sort of printing, you know, zeros and ones on a ledger, and it's not getting into the financial economy, you know, let alone the real economy? Is, is, it, a, is it a black hole they're pouring money into? It, it's that that's possible. 
if you if you recall the chart we just put up, that shows an index of PBOC liquidity stimulus in eight. That peaked at almost 100 on that index, the orange line you'll see on the left-hand side of that chart. That was a stimulus that basically China put in. It was, there were a number of things going on then, but recall the, Olymp- the Olympics, et cetera, the Beijing Olympics, but effectively there was a huge amount of stimulus that was funded to a very large extent by the People's Bank. Then you see that index kind of side, sidetrack or flatline for quite a while. And the latest reading is up at around 75 to 80. So where we are now is, you know, within sight of the previous peaks, but nothing like as big, you know, but we're, we're up there. This, this data is normalized. So it's, think of it as a normal distribution. The further you go up, the more you, more extreme you are on the, in terms of a distribution. So basically at 80, you're about two standard deviations over. At 90, you're three standard deviations over. So in other words, it becomes non-linear as you start to go upwards. And that would suggest we, you know, we're, we're in sight of the previous peaks, but still some way to go. Uh, but nonetheless, it's important. Is China pouring money into a black hole? That's the $64,000 question or the 64000 you are question. question. Uh, I, I simply don't know. Uh, the fact is that uh, China has structural problems. I mean, my longstanding view, uh, having studied, uh, you know, some decades ago, the, uh, the Soviet economies as an academic, is that China is not a million miles away from really the Soviet Union in terms of it's a planned economy, despite what he's, what he's said, the state-owned enterprises are still hugely important in China. And the way that the economy is revved up is through the People's Bank and state-owned banks doing lending largely to the state-owned enterprises. The local authorities come in and you know, issue bonds for infrastructure, et cetera. But what you've got going on now is effectively that mechanism at work. So will it work again? I don't know. It's entirely possible if you put you know, 10,000 volts through, through the monster, through the Frankenstein monster, maybe it, uh, it, uh, it jumps up. I don't know. But I think that's the thing to watch. If China doesn't recover with all this liquidity going on, there is a more serious problem. And that comes into the geopolitical realm that we need to focus on. But for the moment, one's got to think that the stimulus works and the economy should start to rev up. And what's your view on Chinese equities? I've, I've had a lot of China bears on this show and their viewpoint up up. You know, up to this point has been you know worked out. The Chinese equity market is in a vicious, vicious drawdown that never seems to end. You know, when 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 will it end? Will all this liquidity you know pump some liquidity into the in the, the Chinese stock market? What do you think? Well, I mean, if you if you look at history, it, the answer is it should. And there's no reason why China is any different really from any other economy in that regard. And the more liquidity they put in, I mean, obviously you've got to cure the problem of uh, bad debts in the economy. But you know, the question is how much liquidity do you pour in? And I think they will pour liquidity. And I think the decision's been taken now that they want to stimulate the economy. That's clearly been a priority. Uh, Xi Jinping has made that incredibly clear. And they're doing that. I think the question to raise is, does that require the yuan to devalue further? My view is it does. You know, I think that you know, a lot of the problem that China has got itself into in the last few years is the real exchange rate in China is way too high. It needs to come down. Uh, China is not seeing the, the same productivity catch up with America that it was seeing probably a decade or so ago for a whole host of reasons. And one is that there are clearly trade sanctions of important technology and the decoupling is, is having a deleterious effect. And that must dampen Chinese productivity growth potential. And it must also cause the rate exchange rate to come down. And what that means is, bottom line, is that the yuan has to devalue. And what is your outlook on the, the rest of the world, countries we haven't talked about? So Japan, the Bank of Japan, Europe, the, the European Central Bank, your country, the Bank of England, maybe in India. In terms of the global liquidity picture, what are you seeing? Well, I think that you, you can round it off very, very easily. I mean, at, at the end of the day, I think one's got to look at the two most important central banks worldwide, which is the U.S. Federal Reserve and the People's Bank. That was driving the system. As I've said before, you know, basically the Federal Reserve determines the financial market outcomes. So you can really, you know, very crudely say, you know, what the US, what the, what the Fed is doing is reflecting things like, you know, crypto asset prices, for example. That's at the margin. Okay, that's the extreme edge, but, you know, markets like margins. And so that's a, a very good heads up to the, to the amount of liquidity that the Fed is creating or tech stocks or whatever you like to say. And then if you look at China, the impact of the PPOC is much, much more on the real economy. So look at commodity prices. And, you know, I would underscore the fact since the middle of the year, iron oil prices are up, what, 40%. And that's all because of this Chinese stimulus. 
the Brazilian economy, the Brazilian stock market and the real are benefiting, but that's because of the knock-on effects from iron ore and the Chinese stimulus. So I think you can see these kind of effects working through. To answer your question explicitly about other countries, Japan, I think, is a very good bellwether now for China. I think that one of the reasons the Chinese market, sorry, the Japanese market is doing better is it may be sensing that the Chinese economy is beginning to turn around and Japan is very integrated into the Chinese economy now than it was maybe 20 years ago. So what you're going to get there is, is an accelerator effect on Japanese equities. If you don't want to buy China, look at Japan. So I think that's, that would be my take there. I think in terms of Europe, and the UK, I think sadly they've got deep-seated economic problems. I think they're not going to get out of those quickly. Those problems are geopolitical, they're energy-related, they need a structural rethink, and in many cases they probably need lower currency values. Whether they'll sanction that, I don't know, but that's broadly what, what you should be getting. And that's why, if you look among paper units, that's why we think the US dollar still looks good, but against gold, one's got to come quietly and say, look, hey, I think the gold market or the crypto market is probably a better bet for investors than paper dollars. But paper dollars will outpace <clears throat> excuse me, other paper currencies worldwide. So. Mm. And so just to, to summarize your, your views that we talked about so far, liquidity you know, bottomed in late 2022, early, early 2023. And uh, you, know, is, you think liquidity will continue to rise this year. And you're you know, pretty bullish, it sounds like, on risk assets. So that's stocks. That's crypto, Bitcoin, but in particular gold as well. That are so assets that are sensitive, sensitive to liquidity. I, I wanted to ask you about the Federal Reserve's rate hikes and or, and cuts, the level of interest rates. So much in the financial media, including myself, focused on the level of interest rates where the Fed is going to change rates. You say uh, liquidity itself is a lot more important, but rate hikes are important too. Right now, I believe uh, it's five or six cuts are priced into the market by the by the end of the year. It actually uh, could be a little fewer because we had a, a hot uh, inflation print this morning. We're recording on January 11th. But you've painted uh, you know, in, in great detail your outlook on the Federal Reserve's liquidity outlook. But what about where they'll take rates? Well, I think it really depends on the status of the economy. I think that, that would be one, one take. I mean, our view is that if the economy does go into a recession, even a mild recession, rates will come down quickly below 4%. But I think that you know, traditionally... If you start to see employment weakening noticeably, the Federal Reserve will panic and start slashing interest rates because they've always done that. So I think that that's, that's what I would take. I don't think interest rates are that important in terms of their effect for the reasons I've outlined, but clearly they're a psychological uh, factor which needs to, be, needs to be taken into account. So from that perspective, I think if you put the broader, the broader picture or perspective on liquidity, our view is that this cycle looks like a very normal cycle. I mean, you can anyone who's watching can take their view on that because the, you put the chart up. It, it opened in October of 20, pretty much on cue. It looks like it's going to peak out in late 2025. Liquidity never goes up in a straight line. The market's going to move in a straight line. But that's really the trend. And if markets come back, it's a buying opportunity, not a selling opportunity. And our view is that that's we're constructive. We think that economies are expanding. You know, I was always brought up in the in, in with the view that you know, the best time to invest in risk assets is when economies are sluggish and central banks want to try and stimulate them. And that's always the, the, the best time. So ironically, when the economic news is, is, is poor, that's when you want to you know, grit your teeth and move back into stocks. What you've got to start recognizing is rotation. If we're correct, it should be financials, particularly banks that start, back, start to perform now, that the margin, the ones that will benefit from a steeper yield curve, et cetera. The other thing that will, that will influence interest rates is clearly what's happening in the bond markets. As I've said, I think the, the backdrop is that yields are on upward pressure. That's partly because nominal GDP is likely to pick up from here, but also partly because what is being flanked by the mortgage market is, is, is high yields. So I think you're going to get a steeper yield curve coming out of this. And you, you, know, you could easily see a situation where you get a renormalization of the yield curve in the US this year, or, or actually quite quickly this year. And that would certainly be hugely beneficial to the financial sector. Thanks. And what about sources of liquidity that do not come from uh, central banks, such as oil prices, fixed income volatility, capital markets activity? W what is your outlook uh, uh, in 2024? Well, I think that you've, you've nailed it pretty much. I mean, the three things which tend to be influential is you know, one is the US dollar, two is oil prices. And three is bond volatility, because bond volatility affects the pool of collateral. 
basically what you've got is everything, every one of those three seems to be moving at the moment in the right direction. Uh, the, dollar, the dollar is softening a little bit, technically. Uh, we don't think that's uh, likely to be a long-term issue, a, a long-term feature, because I think that the trend in the US dollar, in our view, is, is upwards. But there's a case for a correction, mild correction. If you look at oil prices, they're clearly depressed at the moment, and they're not an inflation, they're not, they're not a source of inflation right now. And as oil prices come back, they release a lot of liquidity because oil or the energy sector is very, very liquidity intensive. So that's clearly been a factor. And then you've got on top of that bond volatility. Bond volatility has come right down from the highs of last March when it was 200 on the move index. It's now down to about 120 or so. The long, long run average is about 70. It could probably fall lower. I think one of the things the Treasury and the Fed would like to see is lower bond volatility for sure. And maybe they'll try and do whatever they can to do that. Maybe some of the structural changes that are being mooted for the treasury market or a way of addressing that that particular feature. So I think all those things look to me benign at the moment, and therefore they, they should be adding to liquidity. I mean, as a sort of heads up, we think that global liquidity last year in 2023 increased by about 5 trillion US dollars. So from around 162 trillion to about 167, we think that this year it's slated, they're slated to go up by about 15 trillion. So it will, it will be a new all-time high in liquidity. You could say that, you know, it's not a racy increase, but it's still a pretty meaningful increase. And it should mean the risk asset prices go up still. Mm. Never a straight line. What do you say? It's never a straight line. Yeah, yeah. Never, never a straight line. So, Michael, I don't think I'm, I'm exaggerating when I you know, would, would call you the, the godfather of global liquidity and that, you know, you were on the pioneering team at Salon Brothers that created this this methodology. So, you know, needless to say, you know more about this, you, the way that you measure global liquidity than, you know, pretty much pretty much everyone. I, I would say that the t- concept of global liquidity as a leading a leading indicator for asset prices has become much more popular over the past five years. You know, the concept of, oh, there's liquidity in the market, I can sell stuff easily, I can buy stuff easily. You know, that's been in the market forever. But but the way that you define global liquidity, I think a lot more people are talking about that now than they were, you know, five, 10 years ago. And I'm sure that's, you know, that, that's great. But, you, you know, I, I would say as people pick that up, they start to do their own sort of calculations. And, you know, some people have, you know, they think they, they're like, oh, I, I'll calculate myself. I'll just look at the Fed's balance sheet and then I'll, you know, incorporate changes in the reverse repo facility and the Treasury general account. And so basically they, they try and do what what you do but it's a much, much, much less complicated version. What, what advice would you have to people who are trying to track global liquidity themselves in order to you know, make sure that they're factoring in everything as, as much as they can? Well, I think the, the easiest thing to look at is to look at the yield curve. And I would increasingly you know, recommend people to substitute maybe the 10-year with the, the 30-year mortgage bond, because I think that's, that's truer. I think if you start to see a steepening yield curve, it's telling you that liquidity is coming back because that's pretty much how, how the system works. And when we first devised these metrics back when I was at Sunderman Brothers, it was a time when the world economy was internationalizing or globalizing, or certainly financial markets were. And it wasn't then about just the, the US, it's about the world. And then it was Japan, which was really the, the, the key foreign economy. And it's a question of looking closely at the Bank of Japan, et cetera, whatever. But I, but I would say now you, you've got a lot more actors to look at. You've got to look at the ECB, you've got to look at the, the People's Bank of China, as well as the BOJ, the Federal Reserve, et cetera. You know, even some of the smaller central banks like the Reserve Bank of India or the Brazilian Central Bank is definitely worth tracking. So all these things make a difference. We track 80 to 90 economic systems or financial systems worldwide in central banks. That has become, it's a detailed co- calculation, but it's become, We've got a team of people who are working on this. It's a lot easier than maybe it was 20 years ago when we had to do it by telephone and fax, but it's now done electronically, so it's a much cleaner system. But we do put a lot of work into that into that analysis. As I say, it's a complicated issue. If you want a, a quick and dirty way of doing it, then by all means, look at the Fed balance sheet, Fed liquidity, and look at people's bank liquidity in China. Those are the main drivers in many cases, but you, you can often get an errant result if you just rely on two indicators. That's the problem. But at the end of the day, the yield curve is probably a fail-safe guide for somebody who wants a simple calculation. Yeah, for people who want to know more about your methodology, they definitely should check out your, your book, Capital Wars, which we can put on, on screen. And you know, as, as you know, and some longtime viewers know, that's actually how I got the name of this podcast was I said, you know, I'm going to look through Michael Howell's 
book in the in the index and just find a term that I, and, and, you know that that's how I found it. And of course, you've got a, a blog on, on Substack where you, you talk about these issues in you know Wars. yes, also called Capital Wars that you, you talk about it in in a less long form way. So, so Michael, you've you know summarized your your views. People will know you know your views on you know pretty bullish on risk assets because global liquidity will rise. I think you know, a lot of these things, as we said earlier, they can't continue forever. So pretty much you know, for global liquidity to continue to rise, at some point, the Fed will have to do quantitative easing again. You said that you think they'll start to taper maybe as early as March. But when do you think the Fed will actually start to do quantitative easing again? I know this is a kind of a, you know, a tough question. Well, I think in terms of the inflection in the cycle, our estimate is that it's somewhat in late 2025. I mean, that's, you know, that's what the cycles look like. It may be earlier or maybe later, but that, that's what we envision. You say at some stage that the Federal Reserve will have to change. I think the, I think the thing is that the world is different. There is, a, there is a different world out there. And the different world is that we've got aging demographics. We've got huge, huge demands, mandatory spending demands on the government. And the question is, how is this funded? And if you look back historically, there were a lot of avenues that the authorities could actually use to actually avail themselves, avail themselves of, to actually reduce the funding pressures, whether it was lower interest rates, whether it was a primary budget surface, whether it was faster economic growth. Any one of those factors actually reduced the growth or held back the growth in debt to GDP. The fact is now that we're not going to be held by any of those factors. And there are pressures that are actually forcing debt to GDP ratios higher. Effectively, who's going to buy the debt? And so, you know, you come back to the fact that this looks inflationary. And don't just take my word for it. Look at, you know, the, the sort of a lot of the excellent work that John Cochran, who's a professor at, or well, was at Stanford now, Hoover Institution, has written about the fiscal theory of the price level. You know, we think it's liquidity driven as well. But the fact is that you've got to start recognizing these threats. You know, Cochran's work is excellent and really, really demands people looking at it because it's, it's telling us the threat in the future. Yeah, very, very interesting. Well, Michael, thank you so much for joining us. People can find you on Twitter at CrossBorderCap. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you. Thanks, Jared. Thanks for watching. Make sure to show some love to today's sponsor, Public, by going to public.com slash forward guidance. Again, that link is public.com slash forward guidance. Also, Forward Guidance is available not just on YouTube, but on Twitter and on all podcast apps, including Spotify, where a video version of the show is also available. Thanks again for watching. Until next time.